Wait, let me move my face here. Okay. So um, I'll just, to motivate this, I'll just start with some stylized um, facts or ideas. Um, where we live affects how we eat. That's something that I think we all kind of believe. And right? we have a few beliefs about that. So for instance, urbanization is often assumed to reduce hunger, right? It's something you see a lot in the literature, um, actually academic or non-academic, right? Um, at the same time, uh, urbanization is also assumed to increase overweight issues, right? Uh, and we uh, tend to think that we know roughly why all of that is, right? We, we think it's about access to markets, uh, right? Urban markets uh, give better access to food uh, and also about incomes, right? Because in urban areas, people have higher incomes, right? So because of all that, we tend to think that urbanization does reduce hunger uh, or, and, you know, increase um, food intake in good and bad ways. Uh, but how much do we really know about this? How much of this is just an assumption? Well, most of it is kind of just an assumption because, uh, you know, as you all know, as economists, causality is very difficult to prove and particularly location effects are really hard to prove, right? Location effects are a problem because of selection issues, right? People choose to go where they want to be, or, you know, at least most of the time. Um, and so, and so all, of this, uh, all of this makes things complicated. And so this, in this work, what we do is we provide, what I think are the first quasi-experimental uh, results that provide evidence on, on, these, um, uh, on these kinds of things. Uh, so uh, specifically, we have three questions, right? Does being put in an urban environment change food consumption patterns? Uh, does being put in an urban environment change the diet quality? Uh, and the third, we're going to touch on the mechanisms a little bit, right? So is it about market access or is it an income effect? In, in a sense, is this about supply or is it about demand? And there, there is a debate in the literature. I'll talk about that later. So why are we able to do this? Because we have this unique set, uh, setting that is a resettlement program in China, which I'll tell you everything about right now. So the PL program in China, Poverty Alleviation Resettlement Program, uh, is a program that targeted all the ultra poor that lived in remote rural areas nationwide. So it's about 10 million people. It went from 2016 to 2020. Uh, if you, if you uh, paid attention to the news in 2020, China announced that they had eradicated poverty. This is part of the program that, was, uh, that, that participated to that, right? Um, so what was the intervention? It was to give, um, essentially give a new home that met basic standards of living to these people, right? So uh, standards of living, shelter, access to schools, access to clinics. Um, so the idea was these people are too remote. Uh, we can't really provide any services there. Uh, so in order to uh, ensure their basic living conditions, we're going to bring them from wherever they are and give them a new home. Okay, so they go from being less remote, uh, sorry, from being remote to being less remote. Now, as economists, we love this right, because it has two, uh, because it's great for econometrics, right? Uh, for two reasons. The first one is that it's kind of a pure transfer, right? There's no, there's no income transfer involved. They're not allowed to sell the home. They're not allowed to rent the home. There's no, nothing, nothing that kind of pollutes the, 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 the home treatment. It's just... Uh, this is your old home, this is your new home, right? Uh, so, so it's a pure transfer. And the other thing that we really, really like about this even more is that there was a lottery involved. And when there are lotteries involved, we can claim our estimates to be causal, right? Um, so the lottery was not, it, it wasn't, uh, they didn't do it for the purpose of causal inference, they did it for the purpose of fairness. They just wanted to allocate the houses randomly so that nobody complains. Uh, but we, uh, you know, we kind of hijacked that for our purposes. And again, I'll tell you a, a little bit more about that in a sec. So these are pictures. Uh, those are the, you know, kind of previous dwellings uh, that the beneficiaries lived in. Um, this is the lottery. This is a happy winner. And these are the new dwellings, right? So there, there are essentially two kinds. Um, this uh, either either they were uh, these settlements in rural areas or these settlements in uh, urban, semi-urban settlements, right? So these were in the, in the outskirts of towns. Uh, these are the ones that we're most interested in, right? We, we want to know what happens when you get moved to a settlement like this, but we also have these ones in the data, so I'll tell you about that in a second. 
Um, just a recap what happens the, these are the target households right and then they get uh they, they all get resettled sooner or later um and they always get resettled inside of their county where they get resettled is not random unfortunately the, the difference between town and village that's kind of predetermined by geography so that's not random what is random is the timing right so within this group uh, the the timing of resettlement is you know however however soon you manage to be the one who wins the lottery uh, and and it happens as these homes get constructed um, and so we have this randomness here so we can compare the resettled to the not yet resettled that's that's the that's the identification uh, the identifying variation okay so the kind of data we have um, we have essentially three years of panel data in 2016 17 and 19. Um, we have about a thousand households, most of which get resettled at some point during this period. Okay. And of course, because we're looking at nutrition, we have kind of detailed consumption data, which we convert into nutritional data. So I have a slide about that, but you know, in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, elaborate. So with that kind of data, what kind of empirical strategy can we, um, can we do? Well, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a treatment with randomized treatment timing, so it's a classic staggered difference in difference kind of situation, right? Uh, so what does this say? That, that says, you know, two-way fixed effects. And yes, I know about the caveats. We'll talk about the caveats in a second, all right? Um, but, but this is kind of the first, uh, you know, the, 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 the first cut is the, uh, the, the workhorse of development econometrics right now is the two-way fixed effect different diff, right? Um, so uh, just a slight um, addition to this is despite all the, the randomness, we might worry about balance between the treated and the not yet treated, just because it's a small sample and we don't know what kind of function is happening in the data. Um, and, so, and so we also do, we also do a matched specification where you know, essentially a propensity score matching, um, where we, we use lasso predictions to, uh, to, to match the uh, to match the household, it's, it's essentially just a PSM. So the, these are the results that I'll be presenting, but it actually doesn't really matter that much. Um, it makes, um, it just makes our, this graph just shows you that the matching does produce very nicely matched samples, um, but, but the results don't, don't differ. So uh, this is the equation we estimate. It's, it's essentially a difference in difference uh, specification with the unit fixed effects, or I mean household fixed effects, the time fixed effects, and then the two coefficients of interest, the beta two uh, of being relocated to a town and the beta one of being uh, relocated to a village. I should have flipped those betas around, beta two and beta one. Well. Um, okay, so, so these, are, these are the treatment indicators. We include a bunch of control variables, um, you know, any, anything that is not uh, fixed over time. Uh, again, it doesn't really matter whether we include them or not. So, uh, so, so I'm, I'm not going to elaborate. So what kinds of results do we get when we do this? Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to flash a bunch of tables that all look like this. Uh, so I'll, um, I'll start with this one. Uh, essentially, so this is the quantity of rice per capita eaten in the household on average. This is the quantity of uh, maize eaten uh, on average. Uh, I think these are weekly, and they're in grams. Uh, and so if we, uh, our, our different diff essentially tells us that if you were relocated to a town, you increase your intake of rice and you decrease your intake of maize. Now that makes sense. Uh, in that region, maize is kind of less preferred. It's considered to be a food for animals. Um, and so if you can, you're going to prefer rice. Uh, and so it really makes sense that after being relocated to a place with a, uh, with a better functioning market, people will switch to preferred foods, right? Um, those who had a similar treatment, but they were relocated to villages, uh, still reduce a little bit the uh, consumption of maize, but they don't really compensate with rice. So expanding this, uh, expanding this to a bunch of other foods, people increase their intake of potatoes, vegetables, pork, fish, fruit, snacks, and the, generally the variety of their food increases, right? This is a variety score. Um, same thing, uh, or to the, the same estimates for the village relocators are much smaller or insignificant, right? Uh, so again, it looks like being, put, being, being dumped into an urban environment immediately changes how you eat. 
Um, how does that impact your nutritional intake? Well, we're eating more, so you know, more calories, more carbohydrates, more of everything, uh, macronutrients and micronutrients, calcium, vitamin A, et cetera. Um, and if you just convert that to divergence scores, so uh, not just the quantities, but just quantities relative to uh, how much you should be having, uh, so uh, uh, positive numbers are bad, the negative numbers are good, right, because you want to reduce divergence. Uh, so, uh, and unfortunately, you're increasing divergence on carbohydrate, increasing divergence on fat, uh, and uh, so calcium, vitamin A, uh, and riboflavin are good, uh, right, so you're getting more of the micronutrients you need, you're actually getting too much vitamin C, uh, but you're also, you're getting too much car carbohydrates and fats, right, so we're already seeing signs of this not being you know, this is it's more food, but it's perhaps already too much food in some ways. Um, so we wanted to look at pathways, impact pathways, um, and we only have three variables really that we can look at here. Uh, it's the distance to market and frequency of going to markets, and the total income. So what we see those who again those who are uh, put into an urban environment. Uh, are much closer to a market and they go to the market a lot more often. We, we don't see an impact on their uh, income, so it does really seem that this is a supply story and not a demand story, right? Um, on the other side, those, uh, on the other hand, those were located for villages. Um, they, for some reason that we are not entirely sure about, they did um, increase their incomes, but that, but that did not uh, translate into any major changes in terms of food. Okay, uh, and so I got two minutes for discussion. Uh, so of course there are caveats. This is the big thing, the big problem, right? Uh, mostly these two-way fixed effects econometrics, as you uh, all know by now, uh, have recently uh, been uh, you know been, been put into question. Um, and so there's all of these different collections that exist, right? Calais Santana, uh, bacon decompositions, and all of these. Uh, there's even a new one that was just announced two weeks ago at the, uh, at the or a couple of weeks ago at NBER by um, Arendra Jit Dube. Um, local projects is the ID. So I, I tried doing all of these. Maybe I'm not doing them right, but mostly um, all, everything I try just loses significance, right? Because all of these specifications at the core they are all about making the sample, like uh, constricting your sample to something that does work, right? Something that doesn't have the, the two-way fixed effect uh, negative weights problem. Um, and the problem is I have a small sample. And so when I restrict the sample to something that works, uh, I lose significance. So if any of you has any ideas of what to do about two-way fixed effects corrections when the sample is too small to support it, uh, please talk to me uh, because because uh, I'm uh, yeah I'm, I'm still looking for the for the um, for something that will that will strengthen these results even more. Um, but okay, but with what we have, uh, you know, at least in the two way fixed effects, we do have strong results. So we can uh, you know say a few things about those. Uh, so first of all, we do see these big impacts, right? The uh, quasi experimental uh, in a quasi experimental setting, we do see that being put in an urban environment. That immediately affects your, the way you eat um, and your nutrition, right? Increase of food intake, increase of food diversity, increase uh, in, in nutritional intake, perhaps already too much, right? Uh, we don't see that for those um, in the village, so really it does look like it's an environmental effect and it does look like it is a supply effect uh, and, and not an income effect for, from our results. Um, so of course, this is highly context specific. Um, this, you know, we were, the, the, this project um, uh, was, um, you know, was directed to the ultra poor in China. There's no reason to think that we would get similar estimates in a different context that says we can still think about this general behavior, right? And in particular, this idea that the supply side does matter in these contexts is kind of important. Sorry, I'm going to finish in a second. Um, 
Uh, there, there is a literature about food deserts that actually recently has been suggesting that supply doesn't really matter all that much, that it's mostly about demand, that, uh, you know, people, um, that, that, that it's demand and preferences that drive these lower nutritional, nutritional income, uh, outcomes in, in food deserts in the U.S., so different context. Uh, but so at least we can say that in our context, the, 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 the supply does matter. Um, and you know, of course, it, it's it's highlighting these uh, these uh, overnutrition conditions that are looming worldwide. Um, this is a picture of the then you're happy lucky beneficiaries, and that's it. Thank you very much. Coming, you, you you have to speak in the mic because there are people online. So, go ahead. Um, thank you, Dr. Filipski. I just wanted to know if you faced or were there any substitution effects with regards to change in location when you are uh, changing or transferring people to suburban settings? Uh, were there any effects in the substitution, like with regards? Substitution of what? Uh, when they are changing their locations, mm -hmm. if they were farmers and they are moving to suburban locations. Right. In terms so, of uh, activities? Yes. Yeah. Okay, is that, is that the only... The only uh, and the other? next question is, uh, since in the results of the number of food items that you mentioned, there was an increase mm -hmm. uh, with the choice of the change, was it related to occupation? Was it driven by occupation in any way? Like yeah. more labor, increased labor activity, so maybe eating calories. Okay, Th thank you very much. Um, so... But both of these questions are actually pinpointing something that, you know, kind of come, comes up fairly quickly is that a lot changes when you move people, right? We, um, we have to kind of accept this treatment as a treatment, uh, as a kind of general thing, right? Like you've been moved from, from one environment to another environment. Uh, and so specifically, it kind of casts doubt on what, what we say about the pathways, right? But we think that it's about market access. But it's kind of hard to say that for sure, right? Because all these other things are changing, right? So, and we're actually looking at these other things, right? Your opportunities for income in, uh, change. So we know that the, the, uh, the, the, no, the number didn't change, right? We don't see significant incomes in their, uh, or significant changes in their income, but how they get their income might have changed a little bit. Um, you know, and what they do with their time might have changed a little bit. So there are these other things. We're also looking at um, a, a kind of well-being, perceptions of well-being, because the people around you have changed, and suddenly you're in this urban setting, and you're the poorest person there. Um, and it must be, you know, it's uh, it's we know that it that it impacts how people feel about themselves, etc. So we're getting interesting results about that too. Um, so the answer, the specific answer to your questions uh, in both cases is essentially we don't know. We don't have the data for this. But it's a very uh, relevant, I mean, it is probably the most relevant point to bring up here, right? That we have to understand these results as being kind of an environment effect, but we can't really tell what about the environment uh, has really led to these changes. Yes. Ah, uh, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll repeat the question. So, yeah, that is a that's a great point. So we can rule out the kind of the um, liquidity impacts, right? Uh, so we know that they can't they can't transform this wealth into any liquid money. Uh, they're not allowed to rent it. They're not allowed to do things like that. So we can we can um, we can get rid of those impacts. The psychological impacts of like feeling wealthier. 
uh, we can't really rule that out or just kind of the just the long term vision right of thinking well now we have a house we don't need to save as much um these things there's likely some of that going on yeah i think i think that's that's possible yeah Yes. So thank you for coming. Uh, I will be presenting my paper economic value of okay. Economic value of restaurant safety measures and propensity to dine during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we all love going out to eat at restaurants with friends and family, but COVID has left like an indelible mark in the restaurant industry, especially the hospitality sector, which led to a lot of cancelled events. It led to a public health emergency associated with the pandemic, leading to lockdowns, stay-at-home orders, and it severely affected the restaurant industry. Many restaurants even struggled to understand how to maintain safe food preparation conditions or provide provisions for takeout, specifically fine dining. While some consumers were leery of interacting with food establishments in any way, uh, some were just too scared to go out. So. Increasing use of public information and social marketing campaigns aided consumers in making better informed choices about dining options. So what has the already been done in this space? Previous studies have indicated that food away from home choices are influenced by restaurant attributes like perceived healthiness, assessment, value of food cost, overall food quality, and social needs. We also have observed that systematic assimilation of visual effects can help individuals make out good dining out decisions. And further, more studies have done on disseminated information about the segmented consumers' attitudes towards food safety, which could be an important indicator whether you are about whether good food practice services have been undertaken and you want to go out to that particular restaurant to eat or not. So research also shows that restaurants are the largest source of food away from home expenditure in the United States. So what would be my contribution? Now little is known about consumers' preferences for COVID-19 dining safety measures in the dining service scape. In particular, what kind of mitigation measures would induce restaurants, patrons to dine out during COVID and how much are they willing to pay for these meals that include safety measures to limit the spread of COVID? Mind you that this study was done during the pandemic. So a lot of the results would have changed after that. So to address this gap, we conduct a choice experiment to assess the preferences of COVID mitigation measures in the restaurant service gate. So now how do I contribute more. So I contribute to the emerging literature that explores individual subjective beliefs of health risk like pre and post COVID and we evaluate the risk perception and we assess the propensity to engage in averting behavior and the willingness to pay for safety measures. Our consequential script employs the analysis of public goods in engaging other regarding preferences in the script to attenuate her hypothetical bias, which is what we face a lot during choice experiments. Now, our survey data we present the housing level information for Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland. Our SAMP survey instrument, our attitudinal measures, knowledge, beliefs about the pandemic, and mitigation behavior. And the choice experiment is designed to assess the preference for restaurant health safety protocols like outdoor dining and other um, measures like mask on diners, mask on employees, six feet separation uh, while dining out. So I wanted to highlight the COVID protocols in terms of the restaurant services that these states that we surveyed on actually undertook. We observed that Georgia was slow to implement lockdown measures early to open uh, with regards to time i'm just going to quickly skip over these uh florida similar slow to implement lockdown measures and early to reopen i have written down the timeline in order in which how they enforced these guidelines 
South Carolina as well slow to implement lockdown measures early to reopen. However, North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland, I've only presented results for Maryland here, uh, were quick to implement mitigation policies, adhered low to restrictive preventive measures, and reopening business was slower in these states as well. Now, lack of coherent and coercive national response and sole delegation to a certain national level, that is the states to figure out what mitigation policies the restaurants should be undertaking, has been a major problem in the US. So for the experimental design, we collected data from Qualtrics to permit comparative analysis across states with divergent COVID-19 responses using NG for efficient Bayesian experimental design to create 24 restaurant profiles with eight versions and three choices using uninformative priors. Choices followed seven point Likert scale. Each choice was composed of two dining options while restaurant A, restaurant B, or no dining option. The cost attributes were in four levels, which were mentioned as in the slides. Now moving on to the preliminary analysis, we observed that the sampling framework was about uh, 100, about roughly 1200 respondents split equally across the states surveyed. 46% of the respondents were male. Average age was almost 57 years. Average household income was about 100K and examines the attitude about Health measures, 88.7% of respondents indicated the support of initial shelter in place measures and 70.2% supported continued efforts of shelter in place as much as possible as of fall 2020. A high majority was in support from the results from panel B, we can see that a high majority was in support of public health measures. Now, Individuals here, what we want to see is that individuals were more willing to take personal risk, which we can see in panel E, than they were ready to be risky when family was involved, following suit towards career and financial risk. Now, in this diagram, we actually used expected relative frequency responses to gauge subjective perceptions of risk within different contexts. So the specific text in the first scenario that you can see the first chart is shelter in place. Similar queries follow like shelter in place focused on economic reopening and returning to business as usual. How do we interpret it? That interpreting the number of households as relative frequency, this data suggests that an average respondent perceived 70% of risk contracting COVID-19 in the next two months while sheltering place, and the average risk perception elevated to 25.9% during reopening if business were to return back as usual. So uh, in the slides here, I've tried to assess the Likert scales and try to analyze them based on the different states and are segmenting them across females and males. So I'm going to quickly summarize what it means. Here are the metrics for males and females. We notice that the conservative responses, we got some conservative responses from the survey questions from females and males in terms of their beliefs. So this was a response for males. I would love to elaborate after the presentation what it meant. For attitudinal measures, gender was not important. It was observed that age and state played a very important role. We observe individuals who tend to have a higher degree of agreeableness are more likely to comply to a top-down restriction approach. Such actions could help during a public health crisis and that would require voluntary compliance. And individuals with behavioral traits like militism are also likely to adopt preventive measures like social distancing, mask wearing, which can reduce public health emergency like all the spread of the COVID-19 infection. So moving on to our methodology, we build an empirical analysis on the theory of planned behavior and microeconometric models of consumer decision-making while accounting for the complications that arise due to uncertainty, imperfect public information and behavioral anomalies. We use conditional logic approach, conditional logic model for our first approach to assess the economic value of dining out. We use generalized multinomial logic model for our second approach, which nest mixed logic model and scaled a multinomial logic model to accommodate both for scale and preference heterogeneity so that we can see variations across the responses among the individuals. So the first result 
is of the conditional logic model. So what do we see here? The coefficients represent the average margin, marginal utility scaled by an error variance across all observations. So the total observation size was about 10,800 respondents and the coefficients are consistent with what the economic theory is to say. The coefficient of price, which we can see is negative in the second row, uh, in both the cases as expected, for specification one and specification two, which means that higher meal prices are associated with lower likelihood of being chosen. And new dining option row one is positive, indicating a positive utility from averting risk associated with dining out during the COVID-19. Now the remainder of the dining attribute coefficients are positive, which indicates a presence of safety features increase in the dining utility. For example, diners indicate a preference of use of plexiglass barrier, social distancing, outdoor seating, and face mask on both diners and employees. More towards diners than, or more towards employees than towards diners. Now, disposable dinnerware and menu have no influence in specification one, but have a positive influence in specification two, indicating the presence of small group of diners who would prefer getting served their meals on disposable dinnerwares. The relative magnitude of these parameters indicate a relative influence on the probability of choice. Now, this mask on employees is very important as a safety factor in the conditional logic model, while mask on diners is the least important. Specification two also extends into including coefficients for no dining under various risk aversion and risk perception measures. No dining or behavior under continued shelter in place if persist, have a significantly positive influence with greater magnitude as compared to no influence for individuals who merely only support shelter in place and do not believe in continued lockdown policies. An interaction of these subjective risk measures have a considerable effect in no dining out behavior as a function of choice. Sorry. If we move on to the generalized multimodal logic model, now the estimations we get captures the variation in the behavior of individual across the choice set, accounting for scale and preference heterogeneity. Nearly all our attributes for this specification are statistically significant for the base demographic segment. Besides preference heterogeneity for different attributes like no dining option mitigation measures, the respondents also display a significant scale heterogeneity. And we also see that the sign of the explanatory variables do not change except for the no dine option, which tends to be negative for specification two here, which is in row, which is in row one, and which indicate that negative utility from averting risk associated with dying out during COVID-19. Now, this model allows also for the correlation across the different choice situation and the differences in the scale across two models could be represented by the parameter tau in the model. We find significant differences for no dining out in all states, except for Virginia. So a deterministic model with the most exhi exhibits a lexico lexicographic behavior pattern among individuals possessing a strong preference for choosing not to dine out during safety protocol measures for specific combinations of risk perception levels, attributes, and state level preferences, ignoring all present scenarios. The superior fit of the generalized multimodal logic model incorporates the preferences amongst individuals towards dining out behavior, and the welfare estimates seem to improve in the model with this. We also observe, if you see in row one, it falls drastically for the no dine option when subjective measures are incorporated. All right. So empirically, our findings show that with each sequential increase in precautionary measure, WTP improves, and the model permits for welfare analysis for a strong dining under various safety conditions. We also see respondents exhibiting a similar WTP trends as they do for all the specification, and this addresses the gap in the consumer's valuation in response to COVID protocols in the domain of the hospitality industry. Since we are applying a stated preference method to private goods, we explore a new variant of consequentiality. That is, we inform our rest respondents that their choices would have a significant consequence on the dining establishments. We tell them the responses could induce costly investment on the part of the restauranteurs and the respondents to respond truthfully so that the business owners 
do not engage in unwise investments. Should we die out or not, that depends collectively on mitigation measures. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. I think uh, what I'm going to do quickly is to just uh, highlight some of the key uh, interesting results you did in the discussion. Um, of course, I had a uh, real good time reading the paper. You guys did a great job, uh, especially the review and providing the context for the restaurant industry. Uh, I think this is the, of course, as we all know, the one industry that's been uh, really affected by the COVID pandemic for good reason. Um, and uh, I was struck to uh, learn that about, I think, 60 or 70 percent of restaurants closed. Uh, I don't know if that's the case or some of them have been able to get back. Uh, and as I said, a lot of really good uh, results. And uh, you've had some... Uh, you know, variables that you've shown in the in the paper in great detail about the different uh, states in terms of their uh, implementation of their policies, uh, like Virginia and Maryland were quick to implement the. Um, and so I, I think I would have liked to see if, if you can at least categorize these two states and what the effect of the, the policies, the implementation policies would bring into the, uh, the results. We have all the states uh, one by one by, if you do all these, uh, at least two categories to capture that, I think that would uh, be interesting. You may have done a map, skip it, or, but if not, that would be something I, I think. Uh, the other thing I, I, I found really interesting is the, the result, which also makes sense, the, the mask by employees. Uh, that also makes a lot of sense when they have mass that increases the confidence. Uh, uh, but uh, one other thing that I think I, I noticed is how the how the situation may have changed over time. Right now, a lot of things have changed, and uh, I don't know if you plan to do a more uh, experiment similar to that to tease out uh, what happened over time. Uh, but otherwise, great, great paper. I enjoyed reading it. Uh, and uh, I just congratulate you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a second. Do you want to respond? Anything on that? Um, I think we are, are, my second paper looks at the different treatments across the uh, states and trying to capture how the policies change. And actually, you're right, that we do need to do another experiment to see how this has changed over the time and how the, res the respondents are ready to respond now with the same questions. And uh, yeah, I would say that would be really good as well, yeah. So, uh, so while you're getting ready, do you want to have any questions for the Yeah, so we were trying, we were planning to do uh, an experiment with the restaurant to see their perception towards their policies, personally, their own policies at the restaurant level to see how they can engage in to have more. And I think having a good 
see the supply demand side of because this is more towards the demand side because we're just looking at the respondents responses towards dining art behavior but we also want to see what the restaurants feel about it and having a good mix of that can i think maybe attenuate that problem but i'm not sure i'm open to suggestions because um i'm also trying to learn how to improve on my model and research <laughs> But if you have any suggestions, I would love Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's my turn now. We have to. So uh, thank you, and uh, I'm not sure if the video is on for the online attendance. Uh, I know the slides are visible. Uh, but uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, my name is Jakob Suryesus, and uh, together with uh, Subir Baragi, he might be attending online, and Ashok Meshra. Uh, we did this work on uh, food security in, uh, of course, in the post-COVID uh, lockdown, uh, period, uh, the usual disclaimer applies there. And um, our showcase was uh, Arizona State University and uh, our Suvir is with uh, Common America Bank, formerly he was with uh, University of Arkansas and I'm with uh, the Economic Research Service, uh, US Department of Agriculture. So, Let's see. I'm gonna use this to, all right. So I'm organizing my talk around this uh, few uh, bullets. As you can see, I'll start with uh, the introduction and state the research problem real quickly. And then I'll uh, summarize the data and briefly explain the methodology that we've used uh, and then I'll highlight the key results of our study. Uh, and then finally, I'll wrap up the uh, discussion with uh, key takeaways and uh, maybe suggest some uh, possible uh, extension uh, ideas for the paper. And finally, uh, we'll, we'll have some time for the Q&A. So uh, since the outbreak of the COVID pandemic, uh, we all know that households around the world have been facing um, complex and uncertain economic conditions. And this is particularly uh, so for uh, the uh, low income countries uh, and, and even for the uh, poorest of the poor. Uh, so in, in addition to the lingering effect of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there have been some other economic uh, issues that are also putting more pressure on uh, uh, the livelihood of households, such as the high input price, particularly the fertilizer prices, uh, and then the uh, high food price inflation. And uh, we all know right now it's, uh, this has been also uh, intensified by the, uh, the ongoing current uh, Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine. And one thing that's common to all this is that these factors can and do elevate the food security situation of uh, a number in a number of ways. Uh, one could be a loss of income, uh, you know, the disruption in terms of the supply chain, uh, consumer responses, and as well as the uh, policy responses as well. So uh, in the end, the, the result is that the food security situation uh, has been deteriorating uh, in many of these developing countries. So that's what we are trying to link in this study. So although the results vary, uh, we do tend to find some estimates uh, from a global perspective. Uh, a number of studies have shown that the um, the, the, the people worldwide uh, in terms of the food security has really gone, uh, gone up uh, by some estimates. I think just before the 
uh, Omicron variant uh, surge uh, was about 150 million people, which would amount to an increase of about 20 percent uh, in terms of the food insecure people. Uh, others have also estimated about uh, 211 million uh, people uh, in 2020 and 2021 uh, in the ranks of the food insecurity. However, all these global estimates, even though they provide real good information, is that they don't provide uh, country-specific uh, relationship between the uh, food security and, and, and the pandemic. But that's not to say that uh, there were no many studies that were uh, conducted at a country level as well. Uh, if, if you look at the literature, uh, you can see in the, in the paper as well, we do review some of them. Uh, there have been some that have tried to do that, uh, link the COVID pandemic with uh, the food insecurity. But despite uh, the uh, positive relationship between the COVID pandemic and, and food security, of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of uh, the results uh, from these studies. Uh, and most of them actually focus in, uh, in sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, only one, I think, in, uh, in the Latin American countries, uh, that's in Argentina, and, uh, and quite a few, uh, at least five in, in, in Asia, uh, including uh, uh, the country of interest for our study, which is uh, India. And, and as I said, uh, there are some re uh, research that's, that's been done uh, focusing in, in India and particularly relating the food security as well as the, the pandemic. Uh, but most of them uh, focus, this could be also because of the data and when the studies were conducted, but they were all done before the uh, on or before the uh, uh, COVID uh, lockdown. Uh, and, and that's exactly where we are trying to do in this paper. We're trying to fill that gap. Uh, what happened in terms of uh, uh, the status of food security in these countries right after the uh, COVID lockdown. And so with that, we, uh, we aim to achieve two objectives in, in our study. First, uh, how the food insecurity situation is evolving in uh, the post-lockdown uh, period. Uh, the World Bank makes available data in three different time periods. Uh, one was in May to 2020, uh, which was the height of the, the pandemic lockdown. And uh, there are subsequent two rounds of data that were made available in July and September 2020. So. Uh, based on that, we're trying to see how the uh, situation has evolved. And the second one is trying to look at uh, how uh, certain disadvantaged groups have fared in the post-COVID lockdown era. So, so in terms of data, uh, we are using, as I mentioned, the second and third rounds of the high frequency from survey data. This is made available by uh, the World Bank uh, and the states uh, that we cover are uh, indicated by the star there. I don't know if that's uh, really visible from there, uh, but it includes Jack Hunt, uh, Rajasthan, uh, Uttar Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, and uh, Madhya Pradesh. Uh, the, in terms of the, the survey data, uh, it was administered in the second and the third rounds were administered in July and uh, September of 2020. Uh, and the second round, we have a total of 5,005 samples. And in the third round, we have uh, a total of 5,200 samples. Uh, we used the second and third uh, simply because the the food security variable was captured only in these two, two rounds. So within those rounds, uh, finally gives us an unbalanced panel of 10,205 samples. Uh, if we use only the, the balanced panel that uh, goes down to 2,018 samples in, in those rounds. 
Uh, so uh, a little bit about the food security questions. As you will notice, the food security stats was assessed with uh, a series of food access uh, questions. And this range from uh, asking the household about the, you know, limiting its portion size and uh, sometimes running out of food to uh, the household being unable to eat while hungry or even sometimes uh, going the whole day without eating. So that's all captured in uh, these first four questions. And the last one is uh, if none of this happened. Uh, I want to note here that we are using these four questions, but uh, you may be familiar with the, the standard uh, food insecurity experience scale, uh, the so-called FIES has uh, eight questions. So we're using the, uh, f of the last four of these uh, eight questions from the eight FIES food security questions. So there's some uh, a discrepancy there, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's all dictated by the availability of the data that was made available by uh, the survey. So based on the response to the five questions, we categorize the responses into uh, four categories. So the mild uh, food insecurity would be if the answer is yes to uh, any one of the four questions uh, are relevant. Uh, and then we do a moderate to indicate if the answer is yes to uh, two of the, uh, the four questions. And then severe food insecurity would be uh, more than two of the, the four questions. And the food security would be if none of this uh, happened. So, uh, given the ordinal nature of the, the dependent variable, which is the food uh, uh, security question, we uh, chose to use the order product model. And of course, this would allow us to tease out the uh, hierarchical uh, food deprivation status of the respondents. Uh, this has been used uh, successfully in some other studies as well. Um, and based on the observed food security status, uh, the responses could take uh, zero, one, two, and three, and, and that would leave us with uh, three cutoff points. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into details of this one. Uh, and I will go to uh, highlighting some of the results and discussion. So I'll start with the uh, fun facts in terms of uh, the descriptive results. Uh, so a typical household in, in, in our sample has six members and close to three quarters of the households have indicated that uh, we've received some essential uh, foods. Uh, it could be rice uh, or wheat from what's referred to as the public distribution shop or PDS or a fair price shop, which is a very important way of uh, uh, providing support to uh, low income and, and poor households. Uh, for more of the descriptive results, you will find it in our paper, but uh, just to save some time, I'll go into discussing some of the key, key results. So uh, our results are based on two model specifications. Uh, one is on, uh, based on unbalanced panel model, and the other one is on balanced panel model. Uh, so generally, the, uh, during the uh, post-lockdown period, in the second and third uh, survey period, uh, we noticed the reduction in uh, the food security status compared to at the height of the COVID pandemic. And I will discuss the one variable, which is the post-lockdown period variable uh, a little bit, and then we can go to uh, discussion and caution. So uh, as I mentioned, relative to the COVID-19 uh, lockdown period, households during the uh, post-COVID-19 uh, lockdown period were 14% more likely uh, or, uh, to be food secure. So it, it was associated more uh, with uh, the status of food security. Uh, 
a little bit more on that. Um, if, as you can see in the, in the results, households during the post COVID lockdown period, uh, compared to the COVID lockdown period, were also uh, more li likely to experience uh, both mild and uh, uh, moderate, as well as uh, severe food insecurity. Uh, social network variable, uh, this is kind of uh, interesting result that we're getting a household that uh, with some sort of membership in self help group experiencing more food insecurity. We still have to figure out what might be explaining all of that, but that, that's the result we are getting here. And you'll see that this uh, uh, is even more so in terms of uh, households experiencing moderate to severe food uh, uh, insecurity. Uh, real quickly, in terms of uh, households uh, receiving food items from PDS, they, this also showed that they were uh, more likely to experience uh, also uh, the different types of food insecurity from mild food insecurity to uh, moderate and, and severe food security. However, we didn't find any statistical significance relating this PDS program with food insecurity uh, categories. So I will finish with one more and uh, we'll get to. Uh, so the, this is your economic uh, demographic factors. As you can see, compared to the general cost uh, in the uh, unbalanced panel model, the, um, the other cost systems. The scheduled cast and the scheduled uh, tribes experience a higher uh, likelihood of experiencing food insecurity in all the categories. And uh, the same thing is with location compared to the uh, base location. Uh, the other states also had a higher likelihood of uh, food insecurity. So I think I will I'll stop there in terms of uh, time. Okay. Thank you very much. So Thanks. I just I just have a few comments. Obviously, anything related to COVID is a very important uh, yeah. research agenda, and um, you know the, the literature is just uh, replete with many studies along these lines. Is a very important question. Uh, just a couple of few observations. Um, so, uh, first of all, is um, you're exactly right. Uh, most have done pre and during, so haven't done the post. The question that comes to mind is, you know, what you expect to see happen with food insecurity is an effect prior to COVID, COVID. And then the question I have is post COVID, has it returned back to you know, kind of a similar level that it was beforehand. So I don't know if you have the ability to kind of so, look, yeah. look at that, if you can. But anyway, that's one that's one observation. Um, the other observation, and, and I, could, I should reveal my methodology bias, is um, uh, I'm not really crazy about uh, diff stuff or dummy variables, because dummy variables come by their names for a good reason. So I think in this case, what, what the interpretation of this is, is basically controlling for all these other variables. Yeah. And you got the COVID dummy in there, right? That lockdown thing. Yeah, lockdown. yeah. so after you control for those, what's kind of the average effect, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of what you're picking up, which is good. It's good to find that. I would encourage you and ask you is, you know, because we're a kind of somewhere along the lines of what Missouri was talking about, What's the underlying mechanism? What's the process, right? So I think it would be, I don't know if you have data on income prices, that type of thing, in the sense that, um, you know, you think structural equation model, and I'm somewhat of a structuralist, from the standpoint of um, <clears throat> if you put income in or prices and you still are getting something for COVID, right? That's telling you the mechanism not only going through income, but it's also something else related to COVID. So I think there may be a deeper story there if you just had a few other 
of these variables. You know, because in the model, there's no real resource variables. There are these social interactions, which are very, very interesting. So, you know, those are kind of, those, those are the main um, observations I have. And I think those are probably pretty easily addressed and looked at. So I don't know if you want to comment on any of that. No, no, I, I think there are, these are great points. With the first one, I uh, would have to check, we can find the pre-COVID data, data. And that's possible to match. Uh, there may be some data somewhere, uh, but definitely this is yeah. a great yeah. point. The second uh, comment you made also very, very good points. I think definitely we will yeah. try to capture that and uh, these are the information. Okay. Well, good. And, and I, I'll talk with you some more, I guess, in comments. Then. So, has anybody got any questions for it? Yes. Until you. Yeah. I'm going to take that off still. Go ahead. Twinkle. So, you got a question? So the states that you surveyed at that time were mostly Asian states, the political parties, the political party of India. So will you see any differentiating effects Sorry, if you try to capture a survey from the same results? Because you have 84% and 11% Muslim. Yeah. Not much of the Tibetan in terms of uh, ethnicity. But if you capture non-BJP run states, say West Bengal, Tamil Nadu. Would you expect your results to have any change or mm. an impact on safety, security, security questions? Yeah, I think that's that's also another great point. Uh, probably my colleagues would have responded to this one because they have more understanding about the regional defense and stuff. But definitely the variation is not there, as you say, the majority of Hindus. Uh, Muslims and the other uh, may not explain the relation, uh, but definitely the other. Okay, thank you. All right, so let me set my timer for myself because I want to be fair to everybody. Uh, so, so subject myself to the same to same uh, rules. Um, no. Okay, so uh, the title of my paper is uh, What Meal Kits Can Tell Us About the Value of Time in Home Food Production. This came out of a class project in a class I teach with, uh, and my co-authors are Tim Pierce, Jessica Wilbur, and Jin Yang, uh, Yang who is here, uh, who are graduate students at Virginia Tech. So let me cut to the chase. So here is your one sentence take home. Okay, when you leave, there's a result. Okay, uh, 16, we estimate that the value of um, making a meal, the implicit wage rate is going to be called, is about $16 per hour. So obviously the question is, how do we get that estimate of $16 an hour? But when you go back to the elevator, maybe if you remember 16, that may generate some discussion. So here's, here's what I want to do. I want to talk about, first of all, why the value of time is very important uh, uh, in terms of a research question. Go through a little bit of an implicit wage theory that allows us to back out this estimate and the data results and implications. All right, so why is this important? It's important because time is very important in terms of nutrition. All of you today, when we finish this session, are going to go, I got to go eat lunch. I think most of you are going to not even worry too much about the price, but you're going to be worried about the time. I have a session to get back to, okay? Time is extremely important, and this is very important in terms of nutrition policy because when we estimate diet costs, we tend to ignore labor. Now, so let me, let me camp on this for a second. If I ask you as an economist, how do you calculate the cost of a hamburger at McDonald's? Would you exclude labor? No. But if you went home and I asked you how to calculate the cost of a hamburger at home, for some reason, we exclude labor. Okay? So this has very important implications for how we set SNAP benefits and everything else, right? But we need to separate out the policy question of should we raise benefits from the estimate of the cost, okay? 
This is basic underlying intermediate economics. How do you calculate the cost of something? You sum up the cost of the input. Now, if we're going to do labor costs from the home, we've got to come up with an estimate of the wage rate, and that's what this is about. So there's kind of generally two approaches to do this. One is called the opportunity cost approach. The other is called the market substitute. I've done both of these, and we can talk about those. But this third one is one that's not been used, and it really originated with Adam Smith on compensating wage differential. So let me kind of run through that. So here's the underlying story. You've got to know something about household production theory. Household production theory basically says that Consumers do not get utility from the goods they buy in the market. They get utility from the commodities they make with the goods combined with their labor. So in a neo context, that means what? It means we have a nested production function. Nested means there are several stages. So where are those stages of making a meal at home? Well, it kind of goes like this. You look up a recipe. You write down the list. You go to the grocery store. You get the ingredients, you come back home and prepare them. Now, you need to think of each one of those as a different product or commodity in the terminology of household production theory. So what we're gonna be doing is thinking about a household that wants to make that at home by going to the grocery store, okay? And then they wanna compare, I can make this myself or I can order it online from a meal kit service, okay? So the same steps are involved. So at the end, what we're talking about doing is comparing two perfect substitutes, right? One that you have bought from a commercial meal kit and then another you can make yourself, okay? Now, because we're at that level, then we get to this wonderful simplistic household production theory result, which is called the implicit wage to a final full price and difference equilibrium condition, right? The left-hand side is the full price of a commercial kit. It includes the price of the kit plus the value of your time, not the commercial kits making it, the value of your time associated with the kit. The right-hand side is if you produce it at home. So pH in this case is the ingredient cost and then the last term is the value of your time in creating your replica meal kit, okay? Now, <clears throat> one thing I want to point out very clearly, and this is why just looking at prices in terms of diet costs is very misleading, right? Basic math, if you look at that equation, we're interested in the full price. Just because PC is greater than PH does not imply, right? the full price for the commercial is greater than the home price, okay? This is just basic fundamental, right? It's, um, and this is why it's misleading to just look at price of groceries in terms of nutrition. Because the price of groceries, groceries are not a meal, groceries are not a diet, okay? All right, so we saw that for, and this is the implicit wage. Now, this is basically, and the reason it's called implicit is effectively a willingness to accept. This is the wage and the labor supply of preparing it yourself. Um, so what this is effectively measuring is, what do you save money-wise from preparing a meal kit yourself at home? Okay, so that leads to this kind of decision criterion, which is very intuitive. So we have, all of us have a reservation wage or an opportunity cost of time. If your reservation wage is above this implicit wage, then what does that mean? I'm not gonna take a pay cut, right? So if I'm not gonna take a pay cut, it doesn't pay me to make my own meal kit, okay? Alternatively, if my reservation wage is below that, then it's equivalent to if you pay a higher amount. So that's why the word implicit is, right? So the beauty of this is it's very elegant and it's basically just a threshold and then we can do a lot of stuff with it, okay? It's very intuitive. All right, so what did we do? Uh, the students collected data on 60 meal kits, which were randomly selected from the top three meal kit companies. This was back, back in the spring and summer of 2021. 
Uh, we went with the option of three meals and four servings. Why? Because the SNAP benefit program, basically the, the general one is uh, for four servings. So we just got their prices offline, okay? For the uh, home meal kit, right, or the home meal kit prices, this is the ingredients. All these meal kits list the recipe. So we got the recipe, we got the ingredients, and then we went shopping online at Peapod using Washington, D.C. Um, zip code, okay? And we summed up all the ingredient costs, and then that was the ingredient for each meal. That was the, that was the pH, okay? So what did we find? So the average, um, and I'm going to focus mainly on the averages here. So the average here is a meal kit <clears throat> is about $33. The ingredient cost are about $20 and 19. And then that difference, that value added, the numerator in our formula is $13. Now, one way to think about this is, you know, if, again, this is pretty much intermediate economics. Um, you can think of opportunity cost, right? Take the ratio of 32 to 19, and what does that tell you, right? For every meal kit you buy commercially, you could basically have a homemade meal, 1.69 meal kit. Okay, but that's only part of the story. That's just looking at prices. Okay, we, we got to do something on time. Okay, here's the issue with time. You know, the, uh, just as somewhat of an aside, the difficulty with home uh, with, with household production theory and applying it is is conceptually we live this daily. Everybody knows this stuff, right? So conceptually, it's very simple. Empirically, it's very hard because valuing time is difficult, okay? That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it's, it's a challenge. So what do we got? We've got these five basically intermediate stages we need time for. And look at the denominator. Notice it's the difference between how much time it would take if you did it yourself or how much time, your own time would be associated with the commercial kit. So what we assume which I don't think a very strong assumption is the recipe time for both is the same. Why I say that? Because I could go to the meal kit, pull it up online, look at the recipe, write down the recipe, and then go to the grocery store and make it. So we're gonna assume that the time in terms of choosing a recipe is the same. That means T1, TC1 and TH1 cancel out. Two through five, for the commercial kit, that's why you get the commercial kit, because you don't have to do it, right? Once you order it online, you don't have to make a shopping list, you don't have to go to the grocery store, right? So what that means is the denominator here is really two through five for your own time at home. Now, you can imagine that there's no data set where they tell you these different components for a meal kit. Okay, so what do we have to do? So what we did was, and I've worked with ATUS, American Time Use Survey, a long time. They have some very general aggregate categories. So the first one is personal organization and planning. Part of that would be making, choosing a recipe. Um, travel related to purchasing goods and services. Part of that would be travel to grocery stores, right? Um, grocery shopping. The problem with grocery shopping, that's across all meals, right? So we need to get all this down to one meal, okay, per meal kit. The last one is food preparation. The problem with that from the American time use, that's for the entire day. So I don't have time to do it and go through it, but we made some, um, we, we got some supplementary information and basically came up with conversion factors. Because what I have to do here is convert those time categories and assign them to a meal kit, right, or a meal, okay? So this is equivalent, if you know anything about production literature, this is equivalent to the exercise of allocating fixed assets, fixed resources to different outputs, okay? It's the same problem. So, <clears throat> so we did that, and we got these conversion factors. The thing to focus here on is, are these numbers. So we estimate uh, that it takes about 50 minutes for, to make your own meal kit. Now, obviously there's some uncertainty here, so we kind of looked at 10% less, 10% more. I'm much more confident in the interval estimate than I am the point estimate, okay. Um, 
you can kind of look at this, compare this, if you look at the eating and health module from 2014, 2016, which is part of the supplement to the ATUS, um, it's, about, it's usually about 50 minutes per day for food preparation. That's across everything on a given day. So again, we're trying to get this down to a specific meal. So I feel very confident that our interval estimate is pretty good. All right, so what do we do? So those, these are numbers when we put the denominator, the other numbers, the value added, and the numerator, and what do we get? Here's where you're 16, this is where the 16 comes from, okay? So you see on average, it's about $16, the implicit wage, the implicit wage rate. And so, um, you, you can see the lower and upper. There's a little bit of difference across these different meal kit companies, not much. We tested this, there's no statistical difference, okay? But so this is $16, what is this saying? This says the implicit wage rate, it pays you about $16 per hour to make the meal kit at home yourself, okay? All right. Another way to think about it, and this is where the intuition, I think, starts getting really useful and interesting because we like to think in terms of time, is none of you, I don't think, please raise your hand if you would order a meal kit for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Okay, I don't think anybody would do that. Why? Because the amount of time it takes you to do that is very small. Now, the beauty of this formula, I think, and this way of thinking about it is that gets translated into the simplicit wage rate. Okay, so the last time, look at the formula, right? The last time that denominator goes down, so if it only takes you 15 minutes, your implicit wage rate is $53, okay? Very high, it pays you a lot to do it yourself, okay? Go the other direction. Where are you more likely to order a meal kit if it's something that's gonna take a long time for you to do it, right? And so what does that end up doing? That drives down that implicit wage rate, basically saying it doesn't pay you to make the meal kit yourself, okay? So very intuitive. Now, what does that imply? So you got these numbers now in terms of the dollars. What does that imply about the income distribution? It implies that what we expect to see is exactly what we see. Higher income people who have higher reservation wages, right? are more likely to buy meal kits. And that's exactly what you see. But it has other implications as well. And this is, if you start looking at this, if you start looking at who is buying meal kits, it's skewed towards younger generations. Now, the, the nice thing about this is it gives an economic explanation other, other than a preference explanation, right? So this, so this all this, this shouldn't surprise you because it's based on household production theory that this is very Becker, Stigler Becker, right? It's very constraint focused, right? We want, to, we want to extract out of economics as much as we can about cost as opposed to talking about preferences. So that's kind of how this gets framed. So um, cooking is a human capital skill, right? Guess what? Who takes the most time in terms of cooking? People who don't have much skill, the more time it takes, the lower the implicit wage, the less likely you are to do it. Now, this has implications for over time as well, right? If you don't invest in this skill, that um, the return, that implicit wage rate is not going to go up. Last thing I want to do, and we'll cl I'll close with this, is we don't do this, but I want you to think of a continuum from a preparation prepared food all the way from basic ingredients all the way to a restaurant meal. So think of a continuum there, all the way from I can go get some flour and make my own bread, all the way up to I can go out to dinner. And along that continuum, all these different commodities you can make yourself. We, you've probably seen this graph, right? This figure of food at home, food away from home, and we now spend more on food away from home than in home, except for obviously COVID there. The, the nice thing about this formula is, think about what's happening to the implicit wage rate as you go along that continuum. Our, our inclination would be to think, if you just look at money, they're charging more and more, right? It costs more to eat out, 
then it, there's a meal kit. It costs a meal kit is more than getting the basic ingredients. This is why the time component becomes so important. It's not just prices, it's prices relative to time. Okay, so what you could end up happening here is that look at that formula. You could have the case where eating out has an implicit wage rate that is lower than a meal kit. How is that possible? Because you got when you look at that wage rate, you got to think about the price that you're paying for the food, food going up, but how about the time? If the time goes up faster, then the implicit wage rate goes down. So across this spectrum, it's not gonna be a monotonic function of these implicit wage rates. And so what you can end up having is seeing something like this. You see people eating out more, but not necessarily buying a lot of meal kits because the implicit wage rate could possibly be lower for eating out, okay? All right, so we're the conclusion. I'm gonna go through these really quick. Uh, we need time. We need, we need to value time to look at nutrition policies. This is, I think, a very elegant way. Yes, Satellist Paribus is involved here. We can talk about preferences. You can talk about household composition, all that stuff. Yeah, we understand that, okay? Um, but this is a very elegant explanation. I think the key point here is if you just look at money or time alone, you won't get a misleading result. How many of these estimates compare to the other two approaches? This is the same ballpark. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I have I, I feel very confident about any point estimate. I don't feel any confident about any point estimate in anything. Okay. Um, you know, I I'm of the army tile. A view of statistical methodology, it takes maturity to recognize that all models are wrong. Okay, so I think the safe thing we can say is the value of time in the home is probably somewhere in the $10 to $20 range. I think we can say that pretty safely because across all these three different methods, you're getting stuff in this line. Um, I've done a lot of work on SNAP benefit adequacy and using this type of approach. And what you find out is what this is gonna apply, this is kind of on the upper end, is that the SNAP benefits are even more inadequate than we thought. And obviously then, as I've already talked about, they have implications for income, age, and product distribution. And finally, to come full circle, so there you go, $16. When you leave, you can talk about um, what it pays. All right, that's all I have. All right, thank you very much. That was uh, very illuminating. I have, uh, I, I really enjoyed you know, how, how you're uh, looking for a different way of estimating this reservation wage. I think that's a, that's a very clever and important thing to do. Uh, I have essentially three comments that come from my own experience using meal kits, which I think, um, uh, you know, they, they, they match with what you're doing, but I think maybe you're missing some of the values out. So the first one that I was thinking about was the value of the creativity. In a sense, when you were showing this plot where you crossed out, um, you know, the uh, going to the grocery store and, prepar and preparation, uh, you know, of the list, I thought you probably should just cross out the choosing the recipe time too. Because these recipes in the meal kits are fairly elaborate, and it would take me a really long time to, you know, have this idea of uh, coming up with a recipe for beef with yuzu juice or whatever, right? So I think maybe you need to cross this out and kind of value that as well, the kind of the creativity that, that I wouldn't have without, without, you know, Blue Apron or whoever helping me out. Um, the second one is that there's something about the savings that come with uh, getting the small packages. Right. I, I, really, I really value the fact that I can get all these different recipes, but I don't need to buy a bottle of walnut oil today and a bottle of bergamot oil tomorrow and a bottle of you know, some cashew oil the next day. And at the end of the month, I have 18 bottles of different oils that I'm going to waste, right? Um, so that, there, there's a certain idea of I'm saving money by doing this, which I think maybe would increase those estimates of yours as well. And the third one, you touched on this with the skill idea, which I think maybe was the most important for me, was the value of the learning. I really, I, I feel like by doing this for a few months, I learned to cook food in a 
me away. And this, I, you know, in a sense, like, was I paying for a meal kit or was I saving money on cooking classes? So again, this kind of increases my valuation of the meal kit thing. Um, so those are my three. So, so yeah, I, th I think if you include all of these things, you might, you might increase your estimates some more. All right. Thank you very much. So let me respond to those, um, which are relatively easy to, to, to knock out. Um, so first of all, um, if, uh, let's see, where was it? Um, so, so household production theory. What you're talking about, everything about utility not associated through coming through the production function is called process benefits. Okay, so just doing the activity gives you utility as well. Okay, so that was those are two things you alluded to. Basically, you enjoy doing it, whatever, which is separate from the production activity. So in most of these household production models, is the process benefits, the type of thing you are assuming that exists, which obviously is a is a is a limitation, right? Because we know people benefit from that. So that adds uh, a level of, of complexity to the wage rate, right? So you're not just looking at, you know, these standard models, you do the optimization process, and if you have process benefits in there, then um, the, the marginal value is not just the wage rate, it's that plus some other stuff, right? Because you're getting marginal utility out of the process. So that's a standard, that's a standard thing that happens. So you're right, that would, that would be the case. Um, in terms of, I'm, I'm not really clear here on this last one you're talking about, and I shouldn't cross out. What's getting crossed out there is the time associated with the meal kit, okay? So, and so, so, I, because once you choose the recipe, right, and you, you clicked in and paid for it, then it just shows up. So everything in between. So I'm a little bit confused on what you. I, I, I thought the choosing of the recipe, the, the, the very elaborate recipes, and for me to replace that elaborate process of figuring out these recipes would be very hard. Oh, you could, you could include that part of the value. Well, yeah, we'll have to talk about that because I'm, I'm still not clear what, where that distinction is. But anyway, so, um, you know, yeah. Uh, no, because the idea here is basically you are just replicating the kit. So the quality that comes, so essentially, so, so whatever they chose here is just being replicated. It's the same replicate, the same stuff. I mean, the paper we talked about, a lot of times they'll have these, you know, spices, little spice mix. And that proved to be a hard thing to figure out because they, they were uh, spices kits that were unique to the, to the meal kit. And we had to dig a little bit deeper and get the actual recipe for the spices. So, but you're just replicating whatever, whatever you've got. Okay. Uh, so, uh, anyway. Any, it, so, yeah. I, um, I really like this, this problem. I think it's very inspiring and it's good for the reason it's a very available technique. And I can also see the importance in this works to improve the, uh, to the, to the house of the city property. Yes. So I do what house spouse department? The spouse for what house in the for Jewish household, their works are most likely the under written. But I do have a few small questions right now. The first one is in this in this paper, you're determining the labor cost by building by the category of the work they do in this paper. But do you think it is necessary to also consider the official cost, like the person who is doing it? I mean, oh, certainly, yeah. certainly, certainly. I mean, so we've got. <clears throat> so that's a very good, very, very good point. So this is basically the the underlying implicit assumption here is this is for the person doing all the preparation, and you're exactly right. Um, it depends on the what's called the intra-household resource allocation and substitution, right? 
I think in the context of this, that's going to get reflected in the reservation wage, right? The reservation wage is just how we value our time. So um, we have done analysis where we've had single-headed households and separate papers, dual-headed households. The dual head is a lot more complicated, right? But the general story turns out being the same. Um, the, in the dual-headed household, right, what you end up having is people can spend more time cooking because they, they can substitute intra-household time. You can go pick up the kids from soccer while I make dinner, right? If you're a single mother, this is why the single-headed household, this issue is a lot more important, right? Because you, don't, you can't do that intra-household substitution. So that's a, that's a really good point. But you're, yeah, exactly right. This is just for the person who would be doing that. Next question. In the, in the, in the interest of time, we're going to talk about the uh, uh, Well, I mean, this comes out of the equilibrium condition, right? For so, uh, 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 right. so the problem is like, okay, so basically, you're 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 uh, you're thinking that the price of like people uh, making the uh, who make the empty steals the price of wine or like commercial bills, right? No, all you're all you're assuming is there are two commodities you're producing that are now perfect substitutes. Right? Um, if they're perfect substitutes, then there's an equilibrium condition. If the full prices are equal, then you're going to be in different. Basically, you think about this as the slope of an isocross line. Right? Right. So the key here, the technical key is you're replicating the commercial flow. Right. So they're perfect substitutes. Right? Okay. So, so even though they're, the like, wine is enabled by all the other wine is not. But they still generate the same because they're perfect Well, if, if they're so, so the equilibrium condition is basically said that's where you can see the difference between the two. And you know, it'd be a specific. So, this is the main one, and I'm wrong. Set them down, you know, and basically what I'm saying is I have two of these. One, I ordered them online. And one, I did all the work for which we and they're sitting there. And there's a full price associated with that one, and there's a full price associated with that And if those prices are equal, I'm indifferent. It doesn't matter. So that's the key, and then that implies an implicit way. And then that's why that becomes a decision. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, okay. but I, I want to hold you, hold you all up. So anyway, I want to thank you, everybody.